She's a new X-Man. She stars uh, in the upcoming The Marvels and had her own Disney Plus series. But today, we're going back to the beginning with the very first volume of Kamala Khan's tenure as Miss Marvel. The byword starts now. Ladies and gentlemen, nerds, welcome to a new episode of the Nerd By Word podcast, episode 161. I'm Dave. I'm here with my buddy Chris. And this week, we're going back to the first trade paperback, introducing Kamala Khan as Miss Marvel. And we will give it our full review treatment, the likes, the dislikes, the good, the bad, and the ugly, if there's actually anything ugly about this book, to be honest. Uh, but first, as always, it is time for... All right, Chris, so what's new? Uh, I, if you sense a trend on my news stories of late, there's a reason behind that. But um, Marvel's VFX workers, there's a 50-worker crew that has signed authorization cards indicating that they wish to be represented uh, by a union, the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees and Disney Marvel are reaching a stipulated election agreement. So they're going to uh, have an election date here on August the 21st. That's coming very soon as of the time of recording. Um, and workers will have to have voted, return their ballots by a September the 11th deadline. Um, this is coming in the wake of some really bad press when it comes to Marvel's VFX workers. Um, harsh working conditions um, have really come to the forefront of a lot of studios, but Marvel being uh, the real powerhouse when it comes to comic book movies has taken the brunt of that um, for, for better or for worse, I guess. Um, so it's, it's, it's really a positive momentum, I think, especially in the climate that we're at with sag after striking the WGA striking um, and, and the bad press coming out of, of VFX, I think, you know, pressing pause on some of these movies, delaying them um, so workers can get fair compensation is absolutely the right move. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see what develops this story, Dave. Oh, I, I'm right here with you, considering all the reports that have been coming out uh, regarding, you know, the working conditions for VFX artists, particularly when it comes to the work that they are uh, you know, doing on, on Marvel movies in recent years, you know, that the time crunch, uh, all the criticism being leveled against VFX artists by fans saying, you know, the, the effects look unfinished, uh, not really taking into account the working conditions that they're dealing with, the crunch involved, the constant changes, you know, special effects can take a long time. And when they make the last minute changes to a movie, trying to, you know, reconceptualize the special effects to go along with those last minute changes can be extremely difficult. So clearly, uh, working conditions have not been ideal. So anything that can uh, improve those working conditions and make it a little easier uh, for uh, the people involved is, is absolutely a good thing. Yeah, I was happy in, in contrast, I was happy to hear, um, you know, the positive stories coming out of a, a movie that I'd love to talk about. So hopefully we can get past this strike and review it. Um, Mutant Mayhem, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I mean, I, I've seen it twice now and the positive uh, news stories that you heard from everybody behind the scenes between Seth Rogen, Jeff Rowe, uh, everyone kind of making sure that they did not want that to be the case on set and that animators had a much improved environment than what we've heard. So that was positive. Um, and I'm I'm hoping that this trend will give more of the same. Um, I, 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 I am kind of, you know, as a Marvel fan, I am kind of rolling my eyes when people, uh, Adam Devine, who whose work I've enjoyed a great deal are like, oh, this is going to be the death knell and Marvel has ruined the landscape. I think it's such a disingenuous argument to make. Um, but if Marvel has to be the big bad and, and take the hit here PR wise to make actual real progress, then I'm all for it. All right, Dave, you have happy news to bring to me today. 
Yeah, so uh, not not much to report yet as far as what's actually happening here, but um, I caught an interesting report on the uh, website Kotaku that uh, there is another Witcher book in the works. Uh, so uh, our uh, favorite author, whose name I can't pronounce, uh, I'm going to go with Mr. Sapkowski, uh, was on a Ukrainian podcast uh, called Fantastic Talks and was asked if he was working on anything. And uh, he actually said he was working quite diligently on a new book about The Witcher. Uh, and here's a quote from what he said. Uh, I never say these things with me because you never know. Maybe I'll do something. Maybe I won't. And so far, when I said that I would write something and then I didn't write it, people complained as if I had deceived them and as if I had lied. That's why I don't talk about what I'm doing until it's finished. Because until I finish it, I don't think it exists. But since I always make exceptions for Ukrainians, I will do it this time too. Uh, so then he said that... Uh, the next book in the Witcher universe could take a year, but not longer to finish. But uh, he was extremely vague on exactly uh, what the book is going to be about, if it's a prequel, if it's some kind of sequel, if it'll actually um, deal in any way with the characters from the original Witcher series, as he has made it clear in the past that Geralt and Ciri's story is over and done with. Um so it's interesting to see what exactly he's going to do with this, but there is something coming uh, that is uh, set in the Witcher universe from the original author, which I think is definitely cause for celebration. I'm 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 thrilled. Um, I am I am kind of cautious, seeing as like how complete the series felt to me. Um, at the same time, um, I'm also starved for more Witcher content. Um, I know I. I I so greatly enjoyed the third season uh, on Netflix and I am just so desperate for more content. And I'm also conflicted because Henry Cavill is now done with the role of Geralt. So um, as, as one of the articles I read uh, said, it, it is in fact 24 years since the lady of the lake, the final book in the series um, was was released. So it's been quite some time. There was some finality to that tale. So I'm not sure where we're going to head from here. Um, and whether it was intentional or not, it did kind of seem like a shot across the bow at George R.R. R. Martin, like George, get your act together. Um, but I love here. I'll help you out, Dave. Andre Sapkowski. Um, it, so you, you were close. Uh, but but I'm, I'm just a massive fan of that series. It's one of my top three fandoms probably now and um i'm always excited for more content you know this is not uh, the first time that a book series that i really appreciated that had already ended kind of went back and and provided another story uh, i'm reminded of stephen king's dark tower um which is probably one of my all-time favorite book series period and uh, after that series had ended with some finality uh he kind of came out with an untold tale that was set between two uh, two of the other different books and uh, it was called The Wind Through the Keyhole um, and it was shockingly good so um, you know if if you have some trust in the author here I wouldn't have too much trepidation um, even if the, the story had some finality to begin with there's all sorts of ways to tell another story and if the author uh, believes that it's worthwhile then uh, I have high hopes that it's going to be of a quality that is going to be uh, something that I can appreciate yeah, I feel I feel very much the same way. Uh, Untold Tales of Spider Man was a great series in the '90s by Kurt Music. Um, I, I the the few Witcher comics that I've read, I have I have it sitting in my library. I haven't tapped in as much as I'd like, but um, it, I kind of feel that way. Similarly, that it's like untold stories, short stories in between. Um, I mean, like there's there's a lot of real estate with Geralt that you could that you could tell. Absolutely. Alrighty, folks, there you have it. Uh, stick around, and after the break, we are going to be back with our uh, big talk when we uh, review the first volume of Kamala Khan's run as Miss Marvel. <laughs> And we're back with a patented comic book review, uh, reviewing the first trade paperback in Kamala Khan's tenure as Ms. Marvel in this week's... 
Now, obviously, Kamala Khan has been uh, quite a bit in the news lately. Uh, it's a character that is definitely a breakout star for uh, Marvel. Um, having uh, had her own Disney Plus series, co-starring in the upcoming The Marvels, uh, you know, major motion picture. Um, and, of course, in the comic books, going through a evolution and becoming part of the uh, Chris's Radical Mutant agenda. So uh, there's a lot to talk about when it comes to uh, Kamala Khan, but it's also fun to kind of go back to the beginning of this character, which uh, you know was a big risk at the time trying to introduce a new character like this, um, and ended up being you know really great breakout star. So we decided to go back to the beginning to the uh, first volume of uh, Kamala Khan's tenure as Miss Marvel, starting in uh, 2014 with the uh, 19 issue Miss Marvel series uh, written by G Willow Wilson. Uh, with uh, I think the first volume had um, art by Adrian Alfona. Um, and uh, we're going to go ahead and go basically through the first five issues and discuss uh, Kamala Khan's origin. Much like we do our patented movie reviews, we are going to each pick some likes and some dislikes. Uh, I don't think it's going to be a secret since we're big fans of this character that the dislikes are going to be probably a little light. Uh, I was not able to come up with... Uh, you know, three dislikes for this one. Uh, but we'll go ahead and we'll start with the likes, Chris. What is the first thing you liked about this story? Well, I did the extended reading, so I read all 19. So that may skew <laughs> my observations a tad. But because um, I, I just kept reading it, it was it was good. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, the first like that I have for this is it completely nails the awkward teenage vibes. And, you know, you and I working with this age group or right in in and around that age group every day we see just how hopelessly awkward kids can be and um it's not too difficult even to remember myself how how awkward i was and um having crushes like trying to tell people how you feel i have kids all the time come unsolicited and ask me for advice and like i i always joke that i'm not interested in your middle school romance because it will change by the week's end um but i think it, it just absolutely uh has is, is a great coming of age tale i think uh the power set lends itself to that um kind of perhaps a metaphor or some meta contextual stuff of puberty and going through changes but um, it, it's absolutely relatable, um, and Kamala remains one of the most relatable characters in all of comics. Yeah, you know, I, I tend to agree, and I know we're going to talk a little bit about the um, the cultural authenticity uh, of this book a little later, but one of the things that I always really appreciated about this book is although it is culturally very specific, the themes that it trades with are so universal. Uh, it's definitely something that reminds me over on the uh, DC side of like Blue Beetle, right? The the idea of like this this awkward teenager uh, becoming a superhero. And there's you know there's a lot of cultural stuff, but the the themes that they deal with of identity, of independence, of trying to you know forge your own way, those things are so universal that they they really speak to to reader of any cultural background. And I think that worked uh, that worked incredible well here. I think. As far as like really capturing sort of the teenage vibe, um, this is probably in my top three alongside of like um, um, Bendis' Ultimate Spider-Man. I think the first few volumes of that did a really good job with that as well. Um, and, and Blue Beetle over at DC. I really like that first volume of Jaime Reyes as Blue Beetle. I thought that that clicked really well too, for the most part. So I, I think those books are of a cloth, you know? They are uh, generally positive, um, colorful, um, you know, deal with a lot of teenage angst and stuff, but at the same time, um, you know, strive for an authenticity in that experience. And, and they're just really good books because of that, I think. Well, to be fair, I will eternally side eye the Spanish that is used in that first volume of Blue Beetle. But other than that, I did overall enjoy it. And, and I, I absolutely see the, the similarities there. Um, and I think that's what's best when, when, you know, and we'll talk about this, like you said. Um, I think when you truly adapt people, adapt new characters of diverse backgrounds with care and with attention to detail, 
um, it truly shows the universality, the the universal nature of of the human existence. That regardless of background, re- regardless of religion, regardless of ethnicity, we have so much more in common. And and not to get all kumbaya, but I think that's I think that's the real beautiful thing when done well that comics can can bring to us. Oh, absolutely. All right, Dave. Um, I'm going to try not to upset you on this first like of yours, but go ahead. I don't think this is going where you think it's going. I was always fascinated in the early issues uh, of Miss Marvel, how her um, powers work, uh, in particular that she's actually able initially to shapeshift uh, completely uh, and not just like, you know, kind of change the, the mass and density of her body, you know, giant fists and stuff, but initially it's like a full shapeshifter and how that, you know, settles later. And I think there is the real strength, I think, of these first five issues. And and this is something that they clarify a little further down the line, I know. But the beauty of these first five issues is how it deals with um, identity and self-acceptance, particularly um, that there is a real sense from Kamala in the beginning of the story that she just wants to not be herself, that she, you know, has issues accepting herself for who she is, whether that is her looks or cultural background. And she gravitates towards characters, you know, like Zoe, the, you know, the, the blonde popular girl or Carol Danvers, as, you know, as Captain Marvel. And so when she starts first, you know, exhibiting her powers and she fully shapeshifts and looks completely like, like Carol Danvers, blonde hair and all, um, you know, there there is significance to that because she is she's trying to basically self realize uh, by by you know c- becoming somebody else, and then by the end of the story, uh, you know, her having her own suit and not actually shape shifting to to look like a completely different person is a level of of self acceptance. I think that is um, really important uh, to a character uh, like Kamala, and so. Uh, this is probably the thing that I miss the most in the Disney Plus show is this notion of I, I can't accept myself and I'd rather be somebody else. And then moving towards this degree of self-acceptance, you know, in order to be a superhero, you don't have to be a, a, a leggy blonde, you know, like you can be a hero on your own terms and be who you who you are. And And I think that's a real beautiful theme in the first five issues of the series. And so using, you know, Carol Danvers as this jumping off point like this and saying, you know, she, she wants to be this person, but she has to go through this journey to accept herself uh, as a hero. Uh, I, I think that is a very, very smart move from a storytelling perspective, Chris. Tip of the cap, because you were absolutely correct. And that was not the direction I thought you were going. <clears throat> yeah, it is. Um, it really, it truly is a beautiful message. Um, and something that's been truly heartbreaking as, you know, a father of, of biracial children um, and kind of like the learning experience that I've, I've gone in, you know, surrounding myself with family members who are not white Um and seeing kind of the heartbreaking nature of how European beauty standards are kind of like the measuring stick for so many, for so much like cultural milieu or what have you. And then kind of having to like break down those barriers. If you are not a white woman, especially for girls you know, and it can be truly heartbreaking. And then, and then in contrast, seeing that message of self-acceptance, of self-love, of seeing the beauty in yourself um, from a young immigrant girl's perspective uh, was was truly beautiful and, and inspiring. And I'm glad that my daughter, you know, looks up to Kamala as her favorite superhero. Um, and, and so that's that's a that's a message that I think we need a whole lot more of. Absolutely. All right, Chris, what is your second like of uh, the first volume of Miss Marvel? Well, we've square danced around it, tap danced around it a tad, but the cultural authenticity, um, and you you see the co-creators behind this, G. Willow Wilson, Sanaa um, you know, uh, you know, from a Muslim perspective, from a South Asian perspective with Sanaa Aminat, like it, there's an attention to detail here. Um, I have heard people 
who are either of a Muslim uh, faith or of a South Asian background say that it can come across as tropey both in the show um, and in the comic. And, and, and I understand that. And that's not my part, you know, to make that type of judgment. But I will say that as someone who was fortunate to grow up around diverse backgrounds, who spent time around people of the Muslim faith, um, I think there was just like an attention to detail that when you have people behind the pen uh, on art in the editing office, that represent the actual characters that you're trying to diversify a lot of the times with, you know, I think this was part of the Marvel now initiative. Um, this was, if memory serves, this was happening right around the same time that Sam Wilson became captain America, um, that miles Morales was getting a, a big push. Um, and so I think a lot of times with big corporate companies like this, diversity and inclusion is more often than not, unfortunately checking a box. But I think this is at least for me, my perspective, you know, as skewed as it is as a straight white male, um, it, it feels so much more intentional than a lot of stuff does. Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll echo that obviously, um, you know, uh, I, I'm not the ideal person to judge that. And, you know, if people find fault in this, much like you found fault in, in the Spanish use in, in Blue Beetle, you know, I'm not an expert in the field. But I will also say that I appreciated certainly the effort uh, of trying to make this as culturally authentic as possible. Like you definitely see, like you said, there's an intentionality behind what they're doing here. There is an, an effort behind this that uh, goes a little deeper than a lot of other books who try to uh, you know, trade in diversity. And, and I think it gives this book, um, such a, a unique flavor in the comic book market, because there is not a lot in the way of like Muslim superheroes, you know? So the family dynamic in particular of this book is, is really unique in, in the superhero landscape of the big two and, and adds really a lot to the proceedings. So I, I think that is probably one of the strengths uh, of the book is the family dynamic and, and trying to, you know, balance, you know, the, 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 the cultural, you know, traditional culture, the cultural background with sort of the, the push and pull of, of, you know, the culture that she was born into in, in, in America. And I think that's absolutely fascinating seeing her, you know, you know, s struggle with that. I think those sorts of, um, people of, of, of two worlds, so to speak, are always interesting to me uh, because I kind of grew up with that sense myself to a much, much lesser extent, obviously, um, you know, having, you know, a German, a German mother and an American father. Um, there, there is not as many differences as, as what we're looking at in this book, for example, but there was enough there that I, you know, I would ask myself, you know, which, which culture do I gravitate more towards? Is there something in this culture that, that speaks to me? Is there a conflict between these cultures? Those sorts of things. Spoiler um, alert. It's the German side. <laughs> <laughs> those sorts of things are always extremely, uh, extremely relevant to me. And, and I gravitate towards characters like that, that have sort of a duality to them. Um, and, and that's, you know, I, I think just part of my background to a certain extent. So, um, yeah, I, I totally agree with, with your take on the cultural authenticity here. Obviously, again, we're not the experts, you know, on, on Pakistani Muslims. Um, but the effort I think, uh, that was put into this character and the family setup and everything is definitely appreciated. Far and away, my favorite element. And again, I did all 19 issues. But far and away, my favorite element, both in the show and in the book, is Kamala's relationship with her mother, Muniba. Uh, Muniba is my aunt. Like, she's adopted me. Y'all just don't know. Y'all didn't see the paperwork, but that's my aunt, and I love her to the moon and back. I think she comes across as a little bit more tender in the show. Um, but I, I appreciate both interpretations. Um, she comes a little bit more stringent in the book, but I, I love her nonetheless. And I think that there's there's a whole lot of love baked into that character in both, in both iterations. You know, one of the things that I actually probably, when we're talking about cultural authenticity that I appreciated the most um, is when she has to go uh, and talk to uh, the religious leader about the fact that she keeps sneaking out and she thinks Sheik, she's going to uh, Sheik, I believe. Yeah. Sheik Abdullah. Sheik Abdullah. I think it was. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. And she thinks she's getting ready to get this big speech about the evils of Satan and boys. And he's like, listen, you know, you do what you need to do. Um, just make sure you do it, you know, in accordance with, with your, your culture and your faith. Do it the right way. And and, I, and it's like that, that curveball right there, that was perfect. Because they could have tried to, you know, mock this, this religious leader. They could have, you know, tried to play this for laughs in some way or something. Um, but instead, they, they took a very earnest approach to that. And it, it, it rang incredibly true because of that. Um, I think you will find that the good kind of, um, of religious leaders across religions are the ones that, that focus on those sorts of things above, you know, uh, trying to create some kind of stringent code or rules for life. They, they focus on do what you have to do, you know, with, with, with earnestness, with, with goodness in your heart. Um, and the bad, and the bad religious leaders do not do that. Um, so it was very nice to see, um, I guess that kind of level of respect towards her religion and, and the fact that it is not uh, one note, you know, obey your parents and don't sneak out and avoid boys. And, you know, it, it, it goes deeper than that. And I think that was an element I really appreciated. That whole scene um, is when a lot of stuff for me in the series really clicked. And I think it's it holds up. And, and one of the things that I remember most of my conversation with Maria when we talked about the Disney Plus series is it's the first time that she as a Pakistani Muslim woman has seen positive um, depiction of, of Muslim characters in popular media. I mean, like you think post nine 11, we've had so much demonization of an entire faith of people, you know, from a Judeo Christian perspective of, of fear mongering. Um, and it's such a relief to see something different in that it's, it's been a hard 20 years you know, even as someone who is is not Muslim myself, like like my heart breaks for the the people who who've been so woefully misrepresented in popular media. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with that. Um, Dave, what is your second like of of this first volume of Miss Marvel? So I I know this is going to sound a little bit uh, unkind, but um, f- fans as depicted in popular media, generally speaking, kind of suck. <laughs> like, uh, usually here, here. when you see, well, yeah, usually when you see fans depicted in, in popular media in any way, shape or form, they're, you know, fanatic or they're weird or they're out there. Or, uh, there's always something, there's always a negative connotation to being a fan of something, uh, in movies and television shows and in media in general. Um, I have to think even like, of, um, of Scream uh, 5, I think it was. Like, the bad guys are basically obsessive movie fans. Like, that's, that's like, the whole thing. Like, they go full killer because they love a movie series. Like, that. that's that's sort of the thing that you expect. Um, or, uh, worse yet, uh, oftentimes they're just really annoying, right? Like, being a fan of something and really enjoying something is automatically painted as um, just you, you annoy everybody around you. How dare you like something? Uh, and so I really like that uh, Kamala is a, a quote unquote fangirl here of like superheroes and the Avengers. In a lot of ways, she's basically a representation of us as comic readers in that respect. And the book kind of holds up a mirror a little bit to us in that respect. And what we see in this reflection is not necessarily negative, you know, like, so she, so she writes Avengers fan fiction, you know, whatever. Um, but it's very, it's not depicted in an, in a negative way. Like it's just a passion of hers. She really appreciates these superheroes. And when she has powers, she decides to, to emulate them. And so I really like that for a change, the, the fan part is actually depicted in a positive manner. Uh, well, in a lot of ways, it's this fantasy, this fictional fan is so much better than the reality. Um, like I, there's, and, and you know, I understand where you're coming from with that, and it's very easy to feel that way, especially in an online world. Like social media is an absolute poop show when it comes to, you know, the the worst parts of fandoms. I think that the worst parts of fandoms tend to be the loudest, you know. But I think, I think all in all. Uh, the bulk of most fandoms are people that are much more reflective of somebody like Kamala Khan, you know, people who just really have a genuine love for something. Um, 
and and it's just that the, the the toxic elements of fandoms are so much louder they make so much noise so it seems like they they kind of are drowning out the the, the quote unquote regular fans that are not toxic um so again i think what we're seeing here with kamala is a depiction of the majority of fans in various fandoms um and the depiction we usually get is of a much smaller um minority but much noisier uh subse- subsection of fandom and i think that i think that's why i appreciate this uh depiction so much is because it is focusing on the bulk of fandom that usually is more quiet and therefore not as well exposed i guess yeah i think what i love about her fandom hers herself not the fandom of kamala but kamala's fandom is that it's earnest and that it's honest and it's true i think the the subsequent stories where she stands right up to carol this person that she has idolized her you know for much of her life and says no you're wrong and i know that some of those storylines overall are regrettable looking at you civil war Two, but i think from kamala's perspective i think it's i think it's encouraging that you can when you love something to uh, I believe it's James Baldwin, one of my favorite authors, it says, when you love something, you criticize it. You you have the ability to criticize it. And I think that's that's such a welcome change to so many aspects of fandom that you can, you know, from a from a good and honest place, criticize something without coming across as such a sad, insecure individual who's unhappy in their personal life. And then they, you know, they they hash that out on this thing that they supposedly love, but you wouldn't know it by the way they talk about it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right, Chris, that brings us to your third like of the book. Again, I colored outside the line, so I read all 19, and those last couple of issues, um, as much as I love Jonathan Hickman's Secret Wars and Incursions and that Avengers, New Avengers run, like that's some of the best comics you'll ever read. At the same time, tie-ins, you usually kind of look at approaching with apprehension but i i like what they did with that um and and to kind of circle back on on the relationship with her mother like she thinks the world is ending um and so she decides this is the time to tell her mother what she's really been up to and spoiler alert if you haven't read all 19 but the fact that her mother's i already knew that and i'm proud of you and and you know we get a similar sentiment different circumstances but a similar sentiment um at the tail end of of Ms Marvel the the Disney Plus series um so these tie-in books and like were really a pleasant surprise on you know the world coming to an end and Kamala and her supporting cast kind of rallying together people you know telling some hard truths and like you see um, Zoe's character progression there towards the end. Um, I thought it was, I thought it was uh, really cool to see. Yeah. Uh, I, I will say that uh, I agree that some of the tie in stuff that comes through the Miss Marvel book, uh, even I think in the next volume are some of the stronger things that you'll see as far as tie ins are concerned. Um, I will say though, uh, I, I, even Kamala Khan is not immune from the Marvel backpedaling um, of trying to not let, you know, characters move forward. And so it was incredibly frustrating to me on my first read through because I read like the entire Kamala Khan reading order previously um, that they that they actually backpedal on this. Like the, the parents, you know, knowing about her, they end up doing like a mind wipe on them later on in another volume and, and they kind of reset back to they don't know what she's up to. Um, and I thought that's, that is so, that is so typical Marvel. We can't let a, a character progress or their situation change. Um, so they right away had to backpedal on that. I think like in the next volume even, and that, that was really, that was really frustrating because it's a very different dynamic when, when her parents are aware of what she's up to, you know, it's, it becomes, it becomes a, a different kind of push and pull that is also very interesting. Um, so I hated the backpedaling on that, on that, especially because, as you said, that moment with her mother was so strong. It was so powerful to then basically negate that. Uh, I, I, I felt that was really that cheapened the whole proceedings, you know. 
that issue not not the comic issue but that issue of not letting your loved ones in on your secret identity is one of my greatest frustrations in comics period full stop and as a peter parker fan it is the dumbest thing that they have ever done particularly with aunt may like this woman like she's on death's door anyway she's been on death's door since her inception like be honest with her and has so 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 stupid and i love that the current miles run they were like yes screw that and his family's in on it, and they support him. They're worried about him, but they know it's the right thing to do, that he has these powers, that he can help, and that he does help his community. I think it's such a welcome change. I think it's so additive, story-wise. The fact that your family's in on it, Blue Beetle does the same thing. Like It's so, so smart. To just be like, yeah, we're in on it. like, And this whole like, oh no, where did Peter disappear? We've been doing this for 60 years. It's so stupid and reductive and small brain. Like, get out of here with that. And I think uh, that's really one of the reasons why if you, if you look back on the, um, on the CW shows... Uh, the CWDC shows, like the I try, secret I try not to. Stuff. <laughs> I try yeah. not to. <laughs> one of the thing, there, there, are, there are good elements. Okay, one of the one of the things that they ditch very quickly in almost all of the shows is the notion of secret identity. Um, and I know exactly why. Because if you have a supporting cast, um, and they are not in on it, then you are constantly having to bend over backwards to try to find reasons for the supporting cast to be there, you know, like how are, what's their, it's also an insult to that inner circle. Like how dumb are they? I don't know uh, if you've been uh, keeping up at all with my adventures with Superman, but uh, that's one of the things I've really appreciated about that show. We're like eight episodes in and, and you already, you know, Lois has already figured out that Clark is Superman and Jimmy already knew he had figured it out by himself. And, you know, a long time ago because they're like college friends and, and just now they're running with it, you know? And it, it's, it's a, it, it's a good look. I think um, you can, you can kind of trade in the, the secret identity stuff early on in the stories of a superhero, but then I think it becomes very boring and reductive after a while, especially with the inner circle, you know, like with, with, with enemies and all that, you know, in public, I, I that, that part I get, but, if they're really, you know, your loved ones, then, you know, it's 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 kind of odd to keep that one from them. If I have to see Peter Parker's penny loafers thrown over his shoulder one more time. <laughs> Are, yeah. All right, Dave, uh, your final like uh, of Ms. Marvel. So this is uh, not not meant as an insult to any of the artists that have drawn Kamala Khan because there's so many good ones that have come through the various volumes uh, of Miss Marvel. But I think it is probably fair to say that the art on this first volume in particular, this is the most, this is probably the most Pakistani that uh, Kamala gets to look. I think that a lot of her features kind of get... Uh, ironed ironed out a little bit like you know if you know what back, i mean like back become, to that european st- beauty yes standard. yes exactly but here you know she has a very 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 specific look i suppose she very much feels like uh like a pakistani i re- i was just uh i was looking at a preview page of her return to life um in some x-men book i think um and she's like laying there wearing some kind of robe. And I was like, this could be any number of characters. This doesn't hardly even look like Kamala. You know, like it's the, the facial features aren't right. It doesn't lean into her, her cultural heritage, you know, her ethnic heritage. I don't know what's going on here, but this is this just looks like some some random dark haired European lady, you know. Um, and so one of the things that I really liked about this first volume is how strongly it leans into. Yeah, she's she's you know, she's of Pakistani origin. Like it's very, very clear. Her facial features are, are very deliberately chosen here. Um, I really like the colors in this one too. They are, um, they, they, they're colorful and bright, but they're also not like, you know, 
overwhelmingly bright. There's like sort of almost like a, a pastel y look to them. I was just that, gonna that, say, just gonna say, darn it, you took the words from my mouth. Yeah, that looks that it, it almost gives it like a, a it's almost like a dreamy feel. Like I really, really like the way the colors work in this book. Um so the I think the art is really great. I think the colors are fantastic. And you know, there there have been a lot of really good artists on this character. You know, I'm not gonna lie. But there is really something special about this first volume when you go back to it and seeing how deliberate they were about being very clear. This is a Pakistani Muslim superhero. We are gonna make sure she she looks exactly how she should. You know, we're not going to do this whitewashing thing that that so often happens, you know, right down to the coloring. It's very, very carefully and deliberately chosen. And I wish that they would, you know, maybe go back to the style a little bit when it comes to depictions of her, because I think they have kind of started Europeanizing her a little bit. And, and by doing that, she, you know, loses part of what makes her unique in Marvel's landscape. Yeah, I think... Um... I have long stated that I think the the biggest problem, and we could probably make an entire episode on this, like the current state of comics, um, and something we've done something similar early in our show's history. I think the greatest problem facing comics right now is is that exactly the Europeanization, um, the skin lightening of black characters. Um, and it's it's truly a problem, and it's unfortunately not unique to Kamala Khan. Um, you typically have black characters who have, you know, straight bone, straight hair. Uh, they constantly have their skin lightened. Um, it's it's truly frustrating. Um, but in contrast, like I. I the art, the art's great here. Um, the colors, in particular, the pastel vibe. I think for me, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm a very macro person, and so maybe I'm reading too much into the, the subtext, the meta text, all of it. But like, I think it kind of plays into the awkward nature of the character, and the power set, and I, I think it's such an additive element of the story that that it it does just as much storytelling as the script and, and the best art in comics does just that. Yeah, absolutely. All right. I think that brings us to our dislikes. And uh, this was quite a struggle because it is such a solid book. You know, it's, it's very well written. The, the cultural stuff works. Um, it has a great message, but uh, you know, we can nitpick a little bit, Chris. So what have you got for a nitpick for me? Yeah, uh, you probably saw this one coming from a mile away, but everything about the Inhumans seems so forced and silly. Um, I could not care less about Medusa. Homegirl has hair. Congratulations. Your lead character can't talk. Great. Just thrilling storytelling. Uh, And then we have the rampant canine agenda. Like Lockjaw's fine, but let's 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 just chill with this. Like, duh, it's a dog. Oh, it's a dog. I'm 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 a cat person. I've I've never made no secrets about that. Um, it's not cute when dogs be like leaving slobber all over you. Uh, okay, but yeah, nothing nothing really is unique and stands out about the Inhumans, and that's why they've, to borrow your phrase, gone the way of the dodo. You know, just to mess with you, if I ever if I ever make it in the comic book industry, and Marvel offers me a book, I'm gonna write Inhumans. Why would you sabotage your career like that? <laughs> <laughs> I, th- I think I, I think actually there's a there's a good core concept in there. Nobody has really you know gotten to a good execution, uh, but that that's neither here nor there. I think that in to say the least, that they are basically irrelevant. Um, and and I think we've discussed this before, but that's actually kind of what I like about her being an inhuman as opposed to being you know what she is now, which is an X Men. I really ho- I really hope. As a mutant, uh, the whole mutant world doesn't completely take over who she is. Um, because in this book, where the Inhumans are peripheral, she gets to really stand on her own and kind of make her own way. So I think, you know, the Inhumans not being uh, a dominant storytelling element of this book is actually to great benefit of, of Kamala Khan as a character. Um, the only thing I will say, though, is... is uh, 
Lockjaw supremacy. Like, if you don't think that that scene where she gives Lockjaw a hug is one of the cutest things in the whole book, then then that is a you problem. That is not. And I love cats. I prefer cats too. But if you don't think that that is a cute scene, then uh, that's a you problem, not a problem of the book, Chris. <laughs> well, all I'm saying is goose supremacy. So uh, you can have your flirk and dog if you catch my drift. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Dave, your one and only nitpick of the entire Ms. Marvel comic. I think, I think you know, you can expand this a little bit, I think, but it's to take a very, very long time to move out of a one-dimensional depiction. And I think uh, hinting that they are multi-layered and interesting a little earlier might have been might have been better for this book. When you're focusing, let's just say, just on the first five issues, um, Zoe in particular is so one-dimensional. Um, if I would have not already read through the entire, you know, thing and, and know that she develops into a really interesting character, I would consider her to be one of the singular most throwaway characters in the entire book. And I will say, to a certain extent. I, I think that uh, Kamala's mom also suffers from being extremely one-dimensional um, with additional layers really only coming along later on uh, in, in this 19-issue run. I think, uh, I think her father comes across uh, as a much more multi-layered individual than her mother there in the, in the first five issues in particular. Um, and, I, and I thought that was, you know, sad. I, I, you know, hinting at some of these additional layers earlier on I think would have been a real benefit to the first five issues. Um, so I, I think we we let some characters in this book, you know, stay one dimensional for a little too long. Yeah. Uh, I, are we that sad that the white girl is the one dimensional one here, though? <laughs> no, no. In I, all I, just, I just think I just think, you know, um, I, I'm I'm a firm believer that there should be there should be only meat on the bone, no fat, you know, and so we doesn't really fulfill a very strong or clear role early on. Um, and I think that solidifies later on. Don't get me wrong. I think Zoe turns out to be a really interesting character. So it, it's hard to make an argument that she even needs to be there at, at the beginning, you know? Um, so I, I think just any character that you're going to include should have some kind of, uh, you know, overall value or purpose or, you know, why is that character there? Um and I think Zoe in particular is one that that has value as the book goes on, but in the beginning it is so clearly not present that it's a, a little a little bit bordering on the annoying. I'm gonna I'm gonna toss Bruno in there, same category as like Oh Bruno's Bruno is very one dimensional at the start. He's also he's really not, a, a character that a becomes really interesting me. later. When yeah. he starts talking about his Nona, like all right, all right, there we go, Bruno. Finally some depth. You know, yeah, yeah, it takes a little while. Immigrating from Italy and stuff like that. I'm like, all right, finally something. So we're cooking with fire now, Bruno. But yeah, um, yeah, I, I kind of hinted at that. Um, the depiction of Muniba, it, it really comes in the clutch. And again, so it, if you read the whole 19 mm -hmm. issues, you get the full picture a little bit better. But yeah, she comes across as kind of like a tropey representation of an immigrant mom and, and kind of restrictive and overly strict. Um, and we don't really get the, the reason behind it and the heart and the protective nature, um, fully fleshed out until, until towards the end of the volume there. And, you know, just to circle back around the Bruno for a second, you know, that's another thing that is so weird. If you've kind of read through the entire, um, the entire Kamala Khan reading order is like, what, what the crap is up with that whole relationship? You know, like very clearly, you know, Bruno has feelings for Kamala. Kamala may or may not even have feelings for Bruno. It's like the writers want this potential multicultural relationship on the table as something that they could play with. But then every time they get close to pulling the trigger on it and actually trying to explore it, they back off of it. You know, it's like they, they want the idea of a, you know, this multicultural relationship and how they could make it work. But at the same time, every rider that's come through there is too chicken to actually try it. So they always get scared and back off of it again. And it's it's a very, very, that is probably the weirdest part of of 
you know, when you look at the trajectory of the character, like wh- what the crap is this relationship supposed to be? Because you, you seem like you want to do something, but you're too scared to actually try it. So what, what what is this supposed to be? It's the weirdest relationship in the entire Kamala Khan reading order. And I will say the one of the most powerful things that I read this entire 19 issues was Kamala's reasoning for mm-hmm. that. And like her parents thought process. Um, you know, as someone who has been the beneficiary of an interracial relationship and a cross-cultural relationship, um, like, I can still see the validity in that argument of why they want her to uh, be betrothed or linked to romantically a Pakistani Muslim, you know, man, because they don't want to lose their culture and lose their heritage and lose their faith in the assimilation into American culture. So I thought, I thought that was really like a juicy detail. Um, oh, absolutely. I, I, I was wanting to see more of that picked up on if, if I continue reading in the next volume. Yeah, but see, that's the thing. It's, you know, it becomes this yo-yo thing, you know, where they make kind of the statement here that's like, maybe, maybe this, this is not such a good idea because, you know, and they kind of go through the reasoning and then they kind of yo-yo back towards those two trying to get together again and then they push them back apart and then they yo-yo again and it's just it becomes this really strange back and forth as you continue reading um like i said it's it's the strangest thing about the whole book as a as a peter parker fan girl please (laughs) let's let's not even broach that topic um (laughs) no let's no let's okay because amazing spider-man 31 i'm gonna go to my grave defending this run okay Amazing Spider-Man 31, that was a good ass issue of comic books. And I'll you can fight me on it, but it was good. And and as someone who loves him and Felicia together, I get it. It was it was a fling. It was a fling and it wasn't really additive to either one of their storylines. So I get it. He's kind of in a casual stage right now. <laughs> I, 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 I'm just, I'm not, I'm just going to keep my thoughts to myself. I don't think this is going to go anywhere productive. <laughs> hey, Tombstone's back though. That's, that's to me in the entire run. The initial story with Tombstone was probably the, the, the strongest part. So that's, that's the thing that would bring me back to reading some more. Is I just really like the depiction of of Tombstone in this run. I think it's fantastic. All right, uh, you have uh, one more dislike, Chris. And this is not Kamala's fault. This is a general nitpick that I have right up there. I don't know. I don't want to like minimize uh, the art thing that we discussed earlier and the erasure of um, you know diverse people and and having their identity minimized by people who can't look at proper art references. However. Tiny little masquerade masks fool no one. Make that girl's mask a little bit bigger. Make that girl's mask. She has, she is a child and she needs to be protected. So give her a bigger mask. And as someone who you're not going to find a bigger Dick Grayson fan than me, but you're also not going to find a bigger culprit of way too tiny masks that's not fooling anybody than Richard Grayson. Stop it. Give that. Give them all a bigger mask so you can actually have a secret identity. Like, what's the point of a secret identity if you're coming at me with your Dollar Tree mask that is super tiny? Like, get out of here. Mm-mm. I think there are, I think there are ways to have visual cues um, to uh, enhance a disguise. The domino mask is obviously such a, a, a trope at this point in superhero comics. I don't think you'll ever fully get away from it. Um, but even something as simple as her, you know, wearing her hair differently, like putting it up in a ponytail or something when she's Miss Marvel, anything like that, to kind of change the shape of the face a little bit and what she looks like, I think that that would make it maybe a little bit more believable as far as like um, um, people not immediately recognizing her. But, as someone, uh, as someone who uh, has an ID badge that has not been updated in ten years. I don't know why they do that to this, Dave. It's absolutely ridiculous. Uh, it's yeah, hilarious. you can totally fool someone by uh, hairstyles. My own daughter did not recognize me when she saw my my name badge. So yeah, 
always liked about Superman, everybody, you know, points at the glasses. But, you know, in, in a lot of depictions, his hairstyle is different, you know, uh, and, and that makes that makes quite a difference, you know. Um, and I, th- I think they did that in uh, Batman, the animated series with Robin, Dick Grayson, particularly in that he had very like um, very specifically like combed over hair. And then when he's Robin, he kind of runs his fingers through his hair and lets it stick up all over the place. And so it's like little things like that that are added, if I think, to a disguise. If you're going to go the domino mask route, you should probably put a little bit of thought into into that part. But that's just I think the domino mask is a is a much bigger criticism of like superhero comics in general than just this one in particular um you know there there needs to be additive stuff that goes with the domino mask to make that a um a valid disguise i think all righty final thoughts on uh the first volume of miss marvel chris i it, it gets an a to an a plus for me um you know my nitpicks aside you know part of that is me just being uh, uh you know teasing but 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 in all honesty, it's that's that's comics at its finest. I truly believe um, it has heart, and that's something that you and I both go to for comics, for escapism, for heart, for inspiration. Um, and you'd be hard pressed to find a book that gives it to you in in spades quite like this. Yeah, I totally agree. This is definitely an A book for me as well. Um... It, there's a reason that you know Kamala Khan is one of my standout new characters. There's something so so positive and inspirational about her. Um, you know, when I first when I read the first volume of of Kamala Khan, I was kind of going through um, withdrawals because Brian Q. Miller's uh, Batgirl was was over. You know, and and that sort of character, you know, the the the, the young girl that is making her own way that you know has challenges in front of her but comes to it with a positive attitude and like like that kind of character always has resonated with me and so miss marvel in a lot of ways kind of uh, filled a void in my reading list um and and there's a reason i'm not a big physical um you know collector anymore but there's a reason that i have uh, this entire run and the next volume in trade paperback sitting on my shelf. It, it was definitely worth it to own physical as well. It's just a fantastic book. All righty, folks, there you have it. Uh, what did you think of the first story arc of Kamala Khan's Miss Marvel run? Uh, you can find us on social media at Nerd by Word or individually at that Nerd Dave and at that Nerd Chris. Let us know what you think. We'll take a quick break and we are back. We're going to have some nerd commendations for you, so stick around. And we're back. We consume some nerdy media and recommend the best that we encounter to you. It's a segment we like to call... All right, Chris, uh, this one I didn't expect, so I am very interesting to hear what you got here. Listen, man, I know your pre- your prevailing thoughts on mobile games, but dude, as someone who grew up with like Sim City, like I remember in elementary school going to the computer lab for Sim City days, like this really scratched that itch for me. I'm talking about Apple Arcade, um, which has released Cityscapes Sim Builder, and of course, it does have the same licensing. It's not Sim City in name, but oh my god. It's there. It's my greatest obsession currently. I have my productivity has dipped at the beginning of this school year. I'm not getting as much done. No, I'm I'm still, but but every waking free moment that I have, I'm playing this game. Um, there are campaigns. There are different gameplay scenarios that you have to work through. Some of your cities that you're creating with are beachfront. Some of them are in the desert. Some are controlled by the mafia. Um, and so you have to go up against that with your planning. You have to keep tabs. Um, it, it's, it's much more kind of like a guided experience than the, than the last versions of, of SimCity that I played. This is not just build up a city so you can destroy it with a monster. Uh, like most of us were when we were kids in the nineties with SimCity. Um, this is, it's just really fun. Um, really big brain kind of strategy game what we love with like stuff like civilization 
Um, I'm just having a blast playing this. You can unlock like landmarks like the Sphinx, um, the Dutch windmills, uh, and add those to your city. Um, and they add they add benefits. They're not just there to look pretty too. Like your your sales capacity for your commercial buildings, your resident capacity for your residential buildings, um, your worker capacity are are added when you add things like this to that. Um, and so like, it's a really kind of expansive game. Um, I will like my one critique is like, once you get to the higher levels of your city, like, like 50 plus maybe 60 or seven, level 70, um, you run out of space. So that's my one critique of the game, but like that initial start of a new map and building your city and watching it flourish to you go from like maybe 500 residents to over 500,000. It's just a really fun ride. Yeah. Uh, it's funny because uh, SimCity is one of those games that completely passed me by. I've never actually played a SimCity game. Um, I like a good uh, turn-based strategy game though. So I may have to give this a shot, but I was, I was very much a civilization kid. Uh, we've talked about that previously. Um, but I never, as a kid, never really owned a PC until, you know, much later, um, like when I went to college. And so um, my selection of PC games was always dependent on like places like a youth cafe that I went to, what they had as a selection uh, that you could play there. Um, and uh, they never had some city. So that's one of the reasons I got into civilization. Um instead of uh, sim city so i it might be something where i just have to go back and just like explore uh that as a franchise and that type of gameplay a little bit because it kind of just passed me by and and maybe i'm just missing out chris yeah i will say um 4.99 a month for apple arcade and and mine is included in my cell phone plan but it it's got some real quality and bang for buck with apple arcade so i know in the age of 8000 subscription services this one i'm i'm getting a lot of a lot of real estate pun fully intended with, even though it's it's included and I'm not having to fork out five bucks a month. So, yeah, it makes sense. Dave, you're nothing if not consistent with your nerd commendations. Well, I think there's a good reason for this one. There's actually two reasons why I'm revisiting some old video games from 2001. Uh, the first is that I was recently sick and I was uh, kind of stuck in bed for a while and had to uh, entertain myself. Um, and the second reason is that these games just recently became available on uh, Nintendo Switch Online as part of their retro games packages that you can play uh, when you subscribe on the standard $3.99 per month package. And that's a couple of Game Boy Color games, The Legend of Zelda, Oracle of Seasons, and Oracle of Ages. Uh, th these are uh, unique games in a lot of ways. Uh, they run on the same engine as the uh, Game Boy game, um, Link's Awakening, uh, but they were not actually developed by Nintendo. They were developed by Capcom. Um, now, Nintendo doesn't have a really good history of third parties developing Zelda games when you look, for example, at the Philips CDI games. However, uh, this actually uh, works stunningly well. Originally, the games were designed to actually be three games, each focusing on an aspect of the Triforce, but they found that uh, that became too challenging as they wanted to link the various games together so you can play them <clears throat> in any order and then use a code to sort of like transfer your progress from one to the other. And by playing both games, you unlock uh, a true ending that ties both stories together. Um but the long and the short of it is that this is very much a classic sort of uh, Zelda formula. Um, you are whisked away to a, a faraway land. There's a crisis. You jump into action uh, and try to save the world. Uh, Oracle of Seasons, as it sounds, is very seasons-based, uh, which means you have a, um, a, a, a MacGuffin called the Rod of Seasons that allows you to change seasons in order to uh, open up new pathways and solve puzzles. Uh, Oracle of Ages is time travel based. You use the Harp of Ages to travel through time. Uh, Oracle of Seasons famously is a little more uh, combat heavy. It's a little more action oriented, whereas Oracle of Ages is a little slower, more methodical, and a little bit more puzzle based. Um, but man, you know, it's kind of wild to go back to this type of Zelda game, considering, you know, we are in a, in a, a sort of a renaissance of Zelda games that are open world. Uh, this is a little more linear. Um, 
but it works so very well. It's polished. Uh, the, the visuals are very, very good for Game Boy Color games. Um, the colors pop. Uh, the gameplay is a lot of fun. I have to say, it's quite incredible how well these games hold up after 22 years. Um, so if you are a subscriber to uh, Nintendo Switch Online, these are obviously included in that subscription. I would highly recommend going back to play these, even though they were not Nintendo developed. They're absolutely fantastic um, and and totally, totally worth your time if you like that old-fashioned Zelda vibe. It, it's, it definitely scratches an itch uh, for a, a type of game that is not really uh, commonly made anymore right now. So absolutely worth it. I'm constantly and continually reminded how much I miss having a Nintendo Switch. So I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to pony up here soon and, and get back on this because I, I really miss playing games like this on the Switch online platform and and getting a, a you know a blast from the past with the, the SNES games that I that I grew up with. So it's it's going to be my next big investment, I do believe. You know, it's it's funny, but uh, I remember there was a report um recently that like something like 85 percent of games released since the year 2000 are not playable on any platform right now like you just you can't buy them anymore um so unless you're you know emulating stuff um there's just such a hole of, of, of like being able to go back and playing classic games um I, I absolutely hate that game preservation is is so low of a priority for so many companies that's why i'm glad that you know xbox in particular is doing backwards compatibility i wish nintendo was a little more consistent with with what they do with their older games you know um you know in in the age of uh the wii and the wii u you know the the online store and being able to outright purchase those old games and then kind of just saying okay you purchased these games but now you can't have them anymore because we're on a different platform now you have to subscribe to a month- monthly subscription service and you only get to play some of those old games and we'll decide if we add more to them later it's it's a very frustrating situation as a big fan of these older games like i just want to have continuous access to them and be able to play them um so this this constant back and forth of whether you can or not is really frustrating uh, i'm glad that these are available again because you know they're just fantastic games all righty, folks, there you have it. Uh, this was a new episode of the Nerd Byword podcast. Uh, if you like what you heard, please find us on your favorite podcasting platform. Give us a rating, review, and subscribe so you never miss another episode. You can find us wherever podcasts can be found, as well as our own fancy website, nerdbyword.com. And in the ever-changing climate of social media, you can find us on every social imaginable at Nerd by Word. And as always, stay well and stay nerdy. The Nerd By Word is written and produced by Chris and Dave, two nerds with a love of all things pop culture. The podcast features music by Al Jimenez with additional drops composed by Joe Biondi. Our show art is by Ashery Design. Find us at nerdbyword.com and wherever podcasts are available. Mm-hmm.